Like Vasquez said in Aliens, let's rock. If you're new to the tribe, Rad is across the table. Rich is behind the mix. My name is Yanni Bormeister, and we are Unity Gym, experts at turning driven people into athletes. This episode is brought to you by the Unify Movement System, the online program that balances strength, flexibility, and fitness in an efficient 60-minute workout so you can unleash your inner athlete. Get daily coaching by us, plus our epic gym and home UMS programs, extensive exercise library, private coaching group, and weekly coaching calls. As a valued listener, use the link in the description to get your first month free. Before we get started, as usual, warm welcome. If you are watching on the Unity Gym YouTube channel, remember to hit that like button. The more likes we get, the more legends get to see this content. And as always, please subscribe if you like what you see. I'm excited to announce that joining us today, we have Phil White from ADPT Physio. Woo. And if you didn't know, Phil started work in the fitness industry back in 2012, first as a remedial massage therapist, and then went on to study exercise and sports science and a doctor of physiotherapy, postgraduate degree. Now he runs ADPT Physio, where they specialize in delivering the athlete rehab experience to everyone. Phil is a massage therapist. Phil has been a massage therapist to the GWS Giants AFL team to Olympians, Paralympians, and a number of other professional athletes. Always good to have you on the show, Phil. How are you, man? Very well. I'm excited about this topic. I think it's one that people have um, yeah, pretty unhelpful ideas about. And so if we can change how everyone in the world thinks about this, and hopefully this one podcast will do that, uh, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Podcast will <laughs> change the world. <laughs> yeah, I think there'll be a lot, like a lot fewer issues in um, over prescription of um, like opioids, over surgery like over kind of done of surgeries people not doing exercise because they're scared of it i think this is going to be the one that changes the world let's do it yeah let's go <laughs> so this question comes from helen madge and she's in our ums online coaching group helen asked can you actually wear out joints from too much exercise and if so is there any way to minimize that damage and uh yeah i think we'll throw this one straight to rad uh we'll talk about a couple of the uh the the, the research studies that we've sort of um uh discovered or been told about well I, w I won't even i won't even talk about a research study because i, I could not tell you where it's from w what i'll talk about is uh one of the experiences that we had with one of our friends and mentors dr tony Bataji, where in one of his workshops i remember asking a similar question or somebody asked a similar question um, and he, and this is going back 10 years now, so that's why I'm not going to quote any study or anything, but Tony reads the studies and he was saying that, um, funnily enough, it's one of the very few downsides to high intensity resistance training. And when I'm talking high intensity, I'm talking very, very heavy, uh, weightlifting over long periods of time is that in those individuals, um, you see, you can see an increase in, uh, joint um, degradation like on early onset arthritis and things like that now that's what I remember Phil what are your thoughts on that yeah so it's something that well, I, didn't get I to think talk about my study oh do you want to go on <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, go Yanni I uh, I actually I'm, I was just kind of going to quickly look it up because I read an article I, it, um, I used to be a bit, uh, quite into bodybuilding and uh, I was a subscriber of T Nation which is actually not a bad source of information you've got people like Lane, Dr. Lane Norton posting on there anyway there was a, a, an article on here that was written by Dr. Stuart McGill who's you know a, a um, an authority on spine. an authority on sort of spine health and and uh, and uh, has done a lot of research in that field and done a research on this field of wear and tear. And uh, in that um, article, he was citing a study that he was involved in, I believe, uh, where they looked at uh, first responders in America, in New York City, uh, 2,000, over 2,000 first responders. So that's uh, police and uh, uh, paramedics and fire um, fighters. And they wanted to sort of ascertain whether exercise, resistance training exercise, reduced the chances of getting injured on the job. And what they found was that there was a very, very um, important uh, uh, like key element, which was the intensity that they exercised at. So you, you, um, the cohort of people that exercised to what was perceived to be or recorded to be at a high intensity were actually more susceptible to injury and more susceptible to wear and tear. And the cohort that exercised at a low to moderate intensity weren't and were less susceptible for injury. So there, there is this, um, uh, and, we're, and we're gonna throw this to Phil in a sec, but my belief and understanding based on that uh, um, article is that 
Yeah, exercise um, done, when done to a moderate intensity or periodized properly is, uh, is very, very good, very beneficial. But if you just go and smash yourself every session, there is a fair bit of evidence to, to indicate that long term, it's not really that good for the body. What do you think, Phil? Yeah, so I'm going to start off with something that I guess might be a bit shocking to people is that even if you did have significant uh, joint like changes, so arth like significant arthritis, uh, that doesn't mean you'll have any decrease in function and it doesn't necessarily mean you'll have pain. So that might be a bit shocking to people, but I would really like you to go and listen to the um, pain science uh, episodes that we've done because that will give you a bit of an insight into it. But it's just a really key one to like, and, and I'm going to talk about how, you know, we want to avoid it, those morphological changes and so morphology being changes in the, in the structure if we can. But I just want to really highlight that, that the understand, like the now current understanding is quite different from where people used to think like, if you have X amount of damage, you're going to have X amount of pain and dysfunction and you're going to need joint replacements and you're going to need this and that. So just want to get that out of the way and be really clear about that early on, that that is just not the case. And if you, um, you know, if you scanned, like most people over the age of 40, they're going to have some level of, I'm always just doing my age plus 10 here. So my <laughs> for, uh, for, for anything, just get, make myself still feel young. Um, but basically you're always like, you're pretty much always going to see some changes in uh, joint morphology, but you won't necessarily have any pain or dysfunction. Um, and you can look at people who have uh, very like, squeaky clean for in, in very common looking joints and they might have pain and dysfunction. So it's again, it's so mo much more complicated than what people sort of have in their head and what they used to think about like damage equals pain and dysfunction. So that's just going to be my first point. Um, now the second point is I want you to think about um, human, I've talked about this on another show, but this idea that Nassim Taleb um, talked about with economies around um, anti being anti-fragile. And so people often sort of think with that like you're either going to be fragile is one end of the spectrum and then robust is the other end of the spectrum. So either you're, it, it will take a little bit of um, force and disruption and you'll, you'll crumble, <laughs> you'll break, um, or you can be really robust and that you just, like you can take a real, um, you know, a, a, re a robust structure will um, take a lot of force, take a lot of load, and then it will eventually get worn away and crumble. But human bodies are different to that. They're what you call anti-fragile, which is that a, pos like that a positive amount of stress will actually make them stronger and stronger over time. So that's how training works. That's how um, progressive overload of, of strength and fitness works is you're basically, if you give it a positive amount of stress, then you're going to become more resilient to that strength, um, to that stress and be able to handle it better over time. So that's, I think, the, the key thing to think here is like, when you're choosing whether or not to do exercise, it's not a matter of like, am will doing exercise now lead to me gradually like degrading my robust butt body and, and, and being in this sort of state of disrepair in my older age? No, if you can dose exercise appropriately, then you can actually make yourself stronger, more resilient, um, and to be able to handle what you do. So. Um, that idea of dosage, I think, is just a really key thing here. And um, I've been using this more and more recently with, with patients, this idea that exercise is medicine. And just like with any medicine, you can take too much of it and have a bad result. Um, but if you take the right amount of it, you're going to get that desired effect. So we need to have, we need to be taking our medicine, but we need to be taking the right amount. And that's where um, th we're going to find that sweet spot. And there are other variables that come into play, and this is why I think it's really important that you get the guidance of someone who's a professional uh, in the field, because, you know, um, arguably, and it is debated that um, form and technique is very important for the concept of loading areas of the body or overloading areas of the body that may not um, respond as well to it. You know, like yeah, it's it's something that's really debated these days. With like people used to like be so strict about technique with absolutely everything and, and we are like we give a lot of guidance around the optimal way to do things because we're always talking about like you know treating your easy reps as if it was a rehearsal for your heaviest possible reps but there's a lot of research into like low like lower level stuff with bad technique like it's not going to be suddenly the make or break or whether you have um, morphology change. So I just want to like, I just want to get that one out there because if some people will listen to this and they'll be listening to a lot of like Greg Lehman's work and Adam Meekins who are some really prominent physios who are, are talking about this and are, they're kind of on the evidence-based side of practice who are like pointing out that, you know, just because you're around your back doing a deadlift or just because your knees come like go into valgus when you're doing a squat, like that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have bad outcomes and that's um, totally true. But yeah, as we like think about when we're trying to then go to like optimal performance with um, 
really pushing PBs and, and really copying what the people who lift the heaviest weights in the world do. We think that, you know, when you're doing low level stuff, it's a great time to practice for, <laughs> for yeah. For the big stuff, that's exactly right. And then there's also the, um, the other variable, which is what we re refer to as structural balance, uh, anatomical structural balance, which is the, and we had a good conversation with Sebastian Orob from Australian Strength Coach, who's a professional power lifter and powerlifting coach and just strength coach all round to many athletes, you know, uh, and, and I, I've been a proponent of structural balance training all of my career. I first learned the concepts from Tony Bataji and, the, and uh, Ch uh, the late Charles Poliquin. And, uh, and, and the, in, in its absolute basic form, structural balance is kind of, uh, you could sort of say, um, you know, if you train one side of the body, then train the other side evenly. Uh, it's opposing um, uh, joint muscle. Every every joint sort of has an agonist and an antagonist. That they move in multi directions, and if you overtrain one side, it can affect the performance of that joint and the stability of that joint, and and you can have you know, um, it can ex it can expose the body to uh, more joint glide, which can then lead to um, passive structures getting uh, uh, aggravated and and I don't want to use the term worn out, but uh, you know. Um, it, the, uh, the passive structures will take more load. And as we've talked about, like there's going to be an optimal load that will stimulate um, a reinforcement of that load, um, of that structure. And then there's going to be, if you go massively above that threshold, then you can start to cause um, overload that that um, passive structure and that can lead to, yeah. to issues. And this is what the UMS program is built. This is our philosophy, is balance. And that balance we, we, t we talk about on a very, very surface level, on a macro level is balance between the three primary attributes of an athlete, which is strength, flexibility, and fitness. But then if you go a little bit deeper, the, the next layer is balance between uh, limb symmetry. You know, we wanna try to keep the body as well balanced as possible from left to right side. And then if we go another layer deeper, it's balanced between the agonist and antagonist muscle groups in every joint. So we're talking now about that anatomical structural balance. And then if we wanna go the next layer down, it's balanced between the stability and the big phasic muscle system. So every it most uh, each joint has an inner unit. Uh, and the most obvious example of this is the uh, shoulder joint has the rotator cuff muscles, which are there to stabilize and, and keep the joint in its um, optimal uh, position or, 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 or I guess sort of localize the joint how would you explain the the, the role of the rotator cuff kind of like that yeah, basically it, it trying the to joint. keep the ball in, in the middle of the socket yeah that's the right understanding. and then on the outside you've got the big phasic muscles the pecs the lats the biceps the deltoids the um the, uh, and these muscles are creating the movement that we see the you know the, the prime movers and you want to have balance between those two, and there is a formula that that that, that strength coaches and 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 sports scientists have studied for many many years, uh, that would suggest that if you can push this amount of load, you should be able to pull this amount of load and externally rotate this amount of load to keep that all in balance. And those those um, formulas very slightly depending on what research you look at and 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 whether that that the the individual is training for a certain sport and you want to optimize certain things. So yeah, it's uh, the, the, and that that is really the philosophy that the UMS yeah, well, is even, built on. Even bigger than that, like zooming way out to then t like uh, bigger picture balance is you're, you're doing a balance of high intensity of low intensity. You've got times where you're peaking, you've got times where you're deloading and recovering. And I think for this particular question, that's probably the most important thing is looking at that really big sort of macro loading picture. Like how are you periodizing your training over time, and how does that fit in with um, the other aspects of your life? So sleep, um, sleep, stress. Uh, nutrition, all those big recovery factors, because as we said, like it, it's you've you've got to have stimulus, but then you've got to have recovery. You've got to have the right amount of stimulus and right amount of recovery, and that's where, like a lot of these sort of looking at people who have, you know, trained heavy weights for a long time, or these you know firefighters who have done heavy and high intensity mm -hmm. stuff. Those firefighters are doing a pretty intense intense job. They're adding intensity into their like they've got stress and intensity in their job. They've got stress and intensity with their training, and that's like likely why they then had these sort of long term. Um, like changes in, in their joint structures because basically we need if you can give your tissues that, that right amount of stimulus and then that right amount of recovery and that might be um, like you can go if you're going higher intensity then you need more recovery it's like all about trying to find that balance of, of giving that um, your, your body a chance to adapt because just remember that every structure in your body is constantly turning over um, 
tissues. So your your skin's constantly turning over, regenerating more skin cells. Your muscles are constantly regenerating more skin uh, muscle cells. Your cartilage is doing that, but all of them and your bones and your ligaments and everything, but it's all doing it at slightly different rates. So um, often when you get into training, you'll be kind of trying to you'll you're trying to improve at the the rate at which your muscles can adapt to things, which is quite a lot faster than the other structures. And especially when you're a beginner, because you're getting the neural adaptations, which are the fastest of all, neural adaptations being able to activate normal muscle units, not neural like nerves growing, they're actually really slow. Um, but basically, like people sort of fall into that trap of being like, oh, my muscles are keeping up, or my fitness, which can improve quite quickly, um, is improving. So therefore, I need to constantly be pushing myself further and further and further until you run into that kind of brick wall. But you just want to think, like, if your muscles are adapting over, like, you can have some significant changes in hypertrophy over six weeks, but for your um, cartilage, for your um, for your ligaments and some bones. and for your bones, like, that's probably going to happen more over the eight, twelve like 14, 16 week sort of time period that if you're like accelerating off in this direction and then the other adaptations are happening slower and, um, and not keeping up, then that's where you start to run into issues where um, you're, you're with those, as I said, with um, your constant turnover, what you're getting is you're getting um, like synthesis and atrophy of all these structures. So, um, and basically if you're having more atrophy and, and, and less stimulus be, uh, and less um, synthesis because you've put a lot of, um, uh, stress on the system then and and too much stress for it to be able to handle without adequate um, recovery so without adequate nutrition and sleep then that's where you start to get these long-term morphological changes and that's really like that's a hard thing to do because human nature is you want to go hard, go hard you want to get yeah. like quick results and, and you know athletes as well like there's a lot of talk about like oh you know i played footy and i played professional sports but now i'm paying for it because i got no you know i can't use my knees anymore and like that they, they will have made decisions in their career that they have to be at the absolute peak as quickly as possible and they won't have followed like the best longevity training they've 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 gone for the best short term to meet their current goals which is you know, we've had um in here t to come and train with us in the gym we've had one of the uh, most highly achieved rugby league players uh, come and train with us and also one of the highest Ironman uh, come and train with us. And both of them said, God, I wish I came and trained with you guys when I was competing because they both came to us after they were competing at the top. Um, and it, yeah, it's really interesting because it, a lot of people think that professional athletes um, they are uh, they just get it right and they're and they're really yeah. really good but and most people know that there's this there's this idea that most professional athletes kind of have a peak and then after about the age of 30 they really can't compete at the top anymore and there's a very few examples i don't remember the guy's name but there was a nba player who is 40 or 41 and this is very recent i'm not talking about years ago who is still playing in the nba and he's got this like the record of the most amount of time playing in the nba most amount of games and he's still he's a he's a defender um and when they looked into what he does he basically has this mentality that everything is just about this maintenance of what he's got rather than this constant pushing for the best uh and i wish i could remember the guy's name um but i'm not american so but, yeah it's it's a, a really key one to to understand because yeah and especially i think it, it's it's changing as well because now like if you're looking at those guys like they're probably in their 40s 50s yep. like yeah, yeah and they were at their peak 20 years ago yeah and 20 so, years, or maybe 10 and 20 years, years ago the there. understanding around this and the application of sports science was nowhere near this what it is now and so it would be quite interesting to see like 20 years from now with yeah. upcoming athletes yeah, if they've done a bit better yeah. but they're always going to be making those decisions about being peaking as Quickly as, as quickly as possible and yeah. hard as possible to get like the the results because they have financial changes on it but when you look at longevity like there is no reason why like you can't train hard throughout your whole life if you just make sure that you're then thinking about those all the different factors of balance that you talked about but even bigger is getting that factor of balance of the programming throughout all the different stresses in your life and trying to keep that that's the point that i wanted to end on you know that we we had a great discussion with tony Bataji on this and you need to take into consideration the other different stress mechanisms in your life financial stress relationship stress career stress sleep deprivation stress if you've got new kids mm. uh, young children you know exercise is a stress on the body nutrition can be a stress on the body if you're either eating too much or you're eating too much junk 
you know, uh, too much processed food that's going to have an impact on your gut, on your on your body, on your immune system. So it's that stimulus and- recovery uh, thing, isn't it? It's always it's the idea this go hard or go home if you look deeper into that it's that people are thinking and they don't even know they're thinking this but they think that it's just stimulus 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 that gives result and yeah. it never is it's a stimulus first and then it's the recovery that creates the adaptation and i, I just want to quickly look at this before we wrap it's, up yeah stimulus positive um, adaptation yeah, yeah well i just want to still like I, I think going to extremes is a really good thing of making things clear i'd still rather be the person who's gone way too hard and exercised way too hard like and cause this these changes in, in morphology than to be the person who never applied any stimulus because like your body adapts to what you spend your time doing and if you have if you've been like oh no i don't want to get bad joints because mm-hmm. i'm like in the future so i'm going to stay away from exercise and then you never give yourself any stimulus then you basically your body's like oh sweet we don't need to put all these expensive resources into cartilage yeah. we don't need to put into bone neural density and then you're going to be so metabolically deranged and <laughs> in yeah. a bad way that basically then as soon as you start to do basically activities of daily living and once you've especially when you get older um when you lose muscle mass when you like all of these things then you're going to get like you're going to have less um, like anti you're going to have structures that will um, basically ha- be damaged from really low intensity stuff yeah, yeah. and you'll end up with like knee arthritis and, <laughs> and yeah. all this stuff anyway and yeah. fear of like, doing and any fear of doing thing and you know, won't have yeah. all the positive benefits that doing that high intensity exercise will have had on your cardiovascular health your muscle density um, your muscle strength and yeah, you can, as I said, if you do have damage, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be in pain. And if you have really strong muscles, then your passive structures are going to be much better off. And just quickly, I like people like, particularly think about this in terms of running. And I want to point out that the mechanism that you actually stimulate bone growth and, and cartilage um, uh, density improvements is impact. impact. And people get so yeah. scared of impact and they think, oh, no, I've got these injuries. I can't do impact. I should just swim and I love swimming. But like people just get so scared of impact but really it's just a matter of dosage yeah. and if you dose properly I, 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 yeah, I, yeah i've got a final thought on this one um and it is all about everything that phil just talked about there to it, my way of giving it in the layman quick and under, easy understanding way is it's periodization if you understand periodization and how to how to use it and if you don't a really simple and easy way is what we apply in the ums which is choose four week training blocks have a peak week followed by a deload week and what that means is that every four weeks you change some stimulus variables and you ramp up to a peak week in the third week where you gradually increase your intensity, increase your load, increase the demand on your body until so that you really understand what you're capable of when you do your peak week. It's not just like, I'm gonna try as hard as I can. And you do an intelligent peak week, but that is followed by a deload slash recovery week. And if you follow that approach, what we've found is that that works really well with yeah. people. And just and zoom out, results. like think about with your training, is it the like and it's totally okay to train hard for events but like think about how does that fit into the bigger picture um and is longevity your your game or is it being the absolute peak of um you know fitness as quickly as possible and and just make those decisions with um good information Mm -hmm. yep awesome well thanks so much for listening everybody if anybody wants to connect with phil phil can be found on instagram at ADPT Physio, and you can book in for an in person session or an online session with Phil at ADPT.physio. And I just want to quickly point out that online physio, it this like this is exactly what we do is looking at that, like, how does your like all your training fit together, and what can you do to make sure that you're, um, yeah, getting, um, basically the best long-term results because that's i think people sort of having their idea that physios is all poking and prodding and yep. needles or whatever but no this is the big stuff that has the biggest long-term effect i can attest to that because it wasn't online it was face to face with you but one of the greatest um aspects of my rehabilitation of a slap tear was just the conversation that i used to have with you which could have very easily been done online where you were just explaining to me you probably should include this in your training for a couple of weeks and then change to this and it was having that conversation with you that allowed me to recover um pretty much 100 percent from a slap tear without surgery at all so there you go love it thanks for tuning in everyone and thanks phil as always and we'll see you for the next episode of the sound of movement podcast this one changed the world